one. Well, good morning. It's absolutely good to you join us. I usually I'm saying thanks for tuning in, but now you're logging in on Facebook and on YouTube. Thank you so much for tuning into this conversation. We're having a conversation around the budget 2020, a post-mortem of the 2.7 trillion shillings read out by the CS Ukur Yatani. What's in it for you? So this time, we're taking the angle of manufacturing. A whopping 20 billion shillings has been put aside for the Big Four agenda. That includes manufacturing. How much of it goes directly to manufacturing? We will find out from the experts here. And how much of it comes back directly to you? There are so many people who mentioned that the COVID-19 gave us an opportunity to come up with different ways of being self-sufficient. Have we really adapted to the new times? That is the question we're going to have. And also from the whooping 940 billion debt payment shillings, are we able to sustain that, knowing all too well that we have about 1.6 trillion shillings being collected from tax revenue? At the same time, pay as you earn has been reduced. Also, collections from the people is not forthcoming. More than 1.7 million people have lost their jobs. We are having a conversation on the post-mortem of the budget. And you're absolutely welcome to give your views as well. You had what was there, what's in it for you. Are you happy? Are you not happy? What would you have liked to see? Use the hashtag BudgetKE2020 and we'll have your questions posed to the people with us today. Let me introduce my panelists real quick. Ms. Phyllis Wakiaga, Kenya Association of Manufacturers CEO is with us. Thank you so much for making time. Rachel Duguna will join us in just a bit. She's a senior manager, Ernest Inyang, LLP. Thank you so much. Mr. Mushai Bunia, Vice Chair, Kenya Association of Manufacturers, right on my left. Thank you so much for coming in. Mr. Kwame Owin is also with us, CEO, Institute of Economic Affairs. Thank you for coming in and making time. Ms. Adija Nanyomo is also with us. She's a partner in direct access, Ernest and Young, and Ms. Jane Dungu, Safal Group, External Affairs Manager, East Africa. Thank you so much for making time. Before we get into this discussion, and remember, you can also contribute to Budget K in 2020. Let us know your thoughts. We are really delving into the manufacturing sector. And I'd like now to welcome Ms. Phyllis Okiaga, Kenya Association of Manufacturers CEO, to make our opening remarks and possibly answer the question for us. Did manufacturing win in this budget or not? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Trevor, for a very good and warm introduction. I want to say hello to everyone in the audience uh, who's following us on Facebook and all the platforms. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you're keeping safe and I hope uh, that you're all well. Uh, today I want to welcome you all to the CAM EY Ernst & Young Budget Seminar 2020. Uh, we will be focusing on the manufacturing sector wins and I'll take us through uh, some of our thoughts before we delve into the details from the other members of the panel. So as we know, the COVID-19 pandemic has devastated the global economies. Uh, we have seen a lot of demand and supply side shocks, and these are similar to shocks only witnessed during war times. It's clear by now that no economy will emerge and start, and the 2021 budget has therefore been prepared against this background. That's a policy uh, framework within which this budget has been prepared. In Kenya specifically, we also have the floods and we have the locusts. Uh, and this is the background within which the budget has been prepared. So it's definitely a season that is business unusual, and uh, that's something that I think as we discuss the budget, we will try and identify, uh, was this business unusual need met by the provisions within the budget. So within a crisis period like this, the main uh, priorities of the budget were, first of all, to ensure that we combat the spread of COVID-19 and flatten the curve, to ensure that we target and offer support to the most vulnerable businesses and households, and also mitigation measures instituted to ensure that there's a strong recovery uh, as we go past COVID and, and adapt to, to the new normal. For the manufacturing sector, competitiveness is the main challenge and should be prioritized by government, and uh, the budget proposals for us should really be looking at supporting the wins uh, and ensuring that we are having opportunities for local manufacturing of a lot of our products for import substitution. And uh, that is something that has come out clearly during this season, the importance and the need of every country to be self-sustainable, as much as we also try and trade globally, but to ensure that for critical items that we can manufacture, that we are able to manufacture them in our country. The other thing is to ensure that we enhance the competitiveness of exports uh, because, of course, domestic markets are not adequate and there is need to export uh, outside the country. So in terms of the mitigation measures, the policy response by government has mainly been in two ways. 
And so far, there has been a tax incentives measures contained in the Tax Laws Amendment Act of 2020. And uh, the Treasury estimates that the tax revenue foregone is about 172 billion. There is also the economic eight point stimulus program, which was estimated to be at about 53.7 billion. Some of the specific economic stimulus for the manufacturing sector, I'll, I'll just give some highlights, I know the rest will go into detail, but some of the direct benefits include the Kenya shillings 10 billion for VAT refunds and pending bills, uh, the 3 billion credit uh, guarantee scheme for SMEs, the 600 million to purchase locally manufactured vehicles, and 712 million to provide credit targeted at SMEs. And just to mention that the 10 billion is refunds for money owed uh, to, to the sector. Uh, under the economic stimulus for manufacturing, we also have the indirect support where fabricators under the metal sector should benefit from 250,000 locally fabricated desks and also 1.7 billion to expand bed capacity in public hospitals. The tourism sector, definitely the support to that sector would also spur uh, some local manufacturing growth because of uh, the supply and the linkages between manufacturing and tourism. So if the sector is fully operational in time, the manufacturing sector would then uh, be a beneficiary. So about the stimulus program, I'll, I'll, I'll just share a few of our thoughts. Uh, we think it's well designed and, and, and targeted. The main issue is its small size, which is about 0.6% of the GDP. Uh, and for sure, size matters in, in, in this matter. Uh, some countries, for example, India, their stimulus program is about 10% of the GDP. So that's more than 10 times the size of our stimulus program. And what, what, why the size is important is the size of the program will determine how quickly the economy recovers. And uh, the size will also reduce chances of secular stagnation and increase the chances of a V-shaped economic recovery. So as we look at this, uh, we need to put that in mind. In terms of the budgetary allocation, as the pillars of the Big Four agenda are linked to the manufacturing sector, we have Kenya shillings 128.3 billion, which is 4.5% of national government spending allocated uh, to the drivers and the enablers of, 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 of the Big Four agenda. And we can debate whether that is adequate uh, as, as the panel. We had specifically for the manufacturing sector 18.3 billion allocated, broken down around the SZ, 3.6 billion money for river tax modernization, 800 million for MSMEs, 715 for the Kyok program, 500 million for dairy processing, and 3.33 billion for Dongokundu. I'll move quickly to the ESC budget wins, uh, some of the ones that were highlighted in the budget speech. Uh, there's the issue of reduction of import duties to lower the cost of imported raw materials. Uh, the one example that was given was around baby diapers. We have local manufacturers of baby diapers and their inputs will now, their input cost will now be lower because of the lower duties. There's also enhanced import duty to guard against unfair competition from imports and I know uh, that's, that's an area that uh, stimulates local production and an area that uh, Kwame normally speaks about, so I'm sure he'll talk about it when he makes his remarks. Uh, we have duty remission, I think a welcome move around PPE, where a duty remission scheme has been put in place for 0% duty for inputs for the production of masks, sanitizers, ventilators, and other PPEs, including coveralls and face shields. Very welcome, considering that we are going to be uh, procuring a lot of PPE items, and I know that even the COVID fund and other local uh, people buying these PPEs are keen to see that these are bought locally. Other critical observations that I'll mention is the introduction of the min minimum tax that is payable by all companies at 1% of gross turnover. Uh, our thoughts are that it will spell doom for loss-making businesses, up for debate and discussion, and I think comparison of how other countries have done, done this. The issue of Buy Kenya, Build Kenya was also one of the areas uh, mentioned in this budget and something that as a local manufacturing uh, body, we do appreciate uh, the need to support and procure locally. Uh, there is need to expedite uh, the issue of listing uh, the items locally available in abundance. Uh, we also did have a lot of experience uh, in the last, or uh, this current financial year that has come to an end, of uh, certain areas where we have had 
government procure locally, whether it's motor vehicles, pharmaceutical products and others, and we will keep measuring the impact uh, this is having uh, on local manufacturing. In conclusion, uh, what I would like to say, more budgetary allocation should be made to combat the spread of COVID-19. Normalcy, confidence and full economic activity cannot resume until the virus is contained and uh, this uh, uh, is something that has to be led from a health side as we balance the issue of livelihoods also. So that is a, a, a discussion that I think will be ongoing as we revert and try and adapt our businesses. There is also need to look at better coordination between the levels of government and uh, this week I think we saw His Excellency the President meet with the county governments to see how we can re reopen and move back to normalcy. Then the tax measures that increase the pain to taxpayers should be avoided. There are certain amendments we have seen that have been proposed that are pulling back a lot of incentives uh, that will really eventually lead uh, to a lot of pressure on businesses that are already struggling due to COVID. So a moratorium on any tax increase is of utmost necessity while we figure out how we balance the fiscal deficit and also reduce uh, the recurrent uh, revenue uh, expenditure that we have as a country. So in conclusion, the proposed COVID uh, economic recovery strategy is welcome and as the association we are working on a sector specific recovery uh, rebound strategy for all the 14 sectors we represent at CAM. Uh, the, the, the reality of the high level of uncertainty of COVID is, is, is clear and the economic implications are still unclear. We are seeing some of them, but how far reaching they'll be is something that will be left for us to see. So I'll hand over to Trevor and uh, yeah, we can conclude and move into the <laughs> panel. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Phyllis, for highlighting all those gains that you think have been made through this particular budget. You say there's need for better coordination and also to relieve the taxpayers from pain that can be avoided. I'm sure that is one thing that most of you would like to talk about. Use the hashtag BudgetKE2020 to reach us and we can also get your views on all these conversations we're having. Phyllis Wakiaga, the CEO of CAM, was just saying that this is a shockwave that are caused mostly just on wartime. And we know we're dealing with the pandemic right now. There's a locust invasion. There's a flooding invasion. There's tax incentives which the government says has clocked 172 billion shillings that have been foregone. There's a 10 billion shillings VAT and pending bills that are supposed to be paid. But most people's argument there is that this is money actually owed to the suppliers. Therefore, it doesn't help much. We know right now, looking at the budget, that the, the level of debt is at 940 billion shillings. So it means essentially for every 155 shillings goes to debts. Does it address the current need of the country? That is a conversation we're having. But we'd like to hear from you mostly. What are the most important things for you on that budget? What would you have liked to see? We'll sample some of your views in this particular engagement that we're having. Budget KE 2020 is the hashtag we're using. And now let me introduce Ms. Rachel Njuguna, Senior Manager, Ernest and Young, to make our opening remarks also on tax implications in the budget statement on the manufacturing sector, something Phyllis has just touched on, saying that the pain to taxpayers should be avoided. Ms. Resha. Thank you, Trevor. And uh, as you already said, yeah, uh, Phyllis had uh, alluded to some of the statements that I'll be making. And uh, we, I have classified my statements as per the tax head. So we we'll first look at the income tax and uh, the rest will follow. From an income tax perspective, we've seen a proposal to introduce minimum tax. And this minimum tax will be payable at 1% of gross turnover. And this is where by installment tax payable in that year is lower than the minimum tax. And uh, it will be payable just like uh, the installment taxes, uh, four quarters in a year. But um, there are some uh, incomes that are exempted from this minimum tax, uh, including employment, capital gains, residential, rental income, and turnover tax. And um, w from uh, listening from uh, uh, the CS speech, it was clear to, uh, to us that uh, the, ta the targeted people are the loss-making entities. And... Uh, uh, looking at it from a wider perspective, we already have loss capping provisions in the law. So this uh, introduction of the minimum tax will hit the the, the companies. Uh, in, I mean, it uh, will be very adverse, uh, bearing in mind that we have the loss capping uh, uh, provisions. Um, and uh, what what didn't come out clear is that sometimes the loss uh, tax loss may come out uh, may arise from. Um, 
uh, in, uh, tax incentives given under the law. So when you look at that perspective, it appears that um, uh, the tax incentive is given on one hand and taken out on the other hand. The other thing uh, uh, about um, that, uh, the 2020 finance bill, there's a proposal to introduce a digital service tax, and this uh, digital service tax will be payable at 1%, 1.5% uh, 1 on gross transaction value. And uh, what the CS said is that he's realized that a lot of business is being conducted on digital platforms. And uh, as we know, digital tax is a, is a global thing. A lot of discussions are happening at the global arena, so uh, from a Kenyan perspective, what our treasury thought is to introduce this tax on turnover basis and uh, to be uh, an advanced tax for entities that already have a physical presence in country. So uh, this will be take the form of a withholding tax, uh, uh, a withholding tax and it will be deducted by only appointed tax agents. So wait and see how this pans out, but definitely th the way it is, it will um, kind of expand the tax, tax net by bringing in non-residents into the tax net. Uh, listening to the CS, he said that uh, through the COVID uh, uh, measures that were outlined in the Tax Law Amendment Act, the government forgo revenue to the tune of 172 billion. So therefore, in this Finance Act, he sort of tries to recoup some of it, and what we've seen is that there are proposals to disallow some capital expenditure that are previously allowable for income tax. And notable, uh, notable ones are capital expenditure on leasing or listing expenses at the Nairobi Stock Exchange, Another one is entrance fees and annual subscriptions made to eligible trade associations and including club subscriptions paid by an, empl uh, an employer on behalf of an, of an employee. Another notable ex uh, I mean expenditure is social infrastructure. This would include costs incurred in the construction of schools, hospitals, roads. What would be of importance is that all these uh, proposals were contained in the tax law amendment bill, but the parliamentarians thought that was not a wise move. So wait and see whether this will pass this time round. So looking at uh, the VAT proposals, uh, what the minister said, of course, here the, that there are some, he has lost, uh, I mean, revenue, and so he's trying to do away with some exemptions to try to recoup that revenue. The first thing is about input tax, and the proposal is that before an income tax, uh, I, I mean, before a company can claim input tax, they must ensure that the supplier who supplied the good or the service has declared uh, the relevant output tax. So this somehow tries to legalize or sanitize the VAT auto assessments that uh, taxpayers have been receiving from the commissioner. I know there's been a lot of noise around them. So what we see is that uh, it will result to inc increased controversies uh, between taxpayers and the revenue authority. And that um, will mean that some taxpayers may, may lose uh, some input tax. And it will be also administratively cumbersome to taxpayers. So in, through our submissions, this is something that that we've tried to uh, talk to parliament and tell them the government has the enough machinery and powers to make sure that uh, the supplier has declared that tax. So the input tax claimant should be left to do his business and just claim the tax as per the law. Moving on, uh, there are some items that were previously taxable, but that then all exempt. One of them is the maize seeds of tariff number 105.01. So uh, that now that one, that one will be exempt. A few other things were zero rated, but now there's a proposal to make them taxable at the 14% rate. The supply of ordinary bread is one of them. Not sure what drove that uh, policy change. The other thing is about the supply of liquefied petroleum gas. What is not clear is that every year the CS in charge of Treasury, they always come up with proposals on, on, the, on the tax status of liquef liquefied petroleum gas. Not sure why it is a pet subject for them, but of course it will make the cost of this uh, commodity go up. The other thing is that uh, inputs of raw materials for the manufacture of electric accumulators and separators will now be subject to VAT at 14%. Uh, not very clear uh, what drew that policy change. Then a few other things that were previously exempt but will now be taxable at 14%. Uh, the most notable ones is inputs for manufacture of clean cooking, cooking stoves, 
and uh, plant and machinery and equipment used in the construction of plastics recycling plant. Again, that will be a blow to the plastic war. Not very sure whether uh, I mean the policies that our government has are uh, in uh, coordinated. Uh, moving on to proposals under the Excise Duty Act, not very many this time round. Uh, the major one was about the reduction of alcoholic strength from 10% to 8% on beer, cedar, peri, and alcoholic strength of spirits. So that means that now more of these products will now be subject to excess duty and thereby maybe arise in terms of uh, revenue co uh, collection uh, on the excess duty f uh, front. Again, um, uh, uh, the CS talked about introducing a voluntary tax disclosure program that uh, will ensure that taxpayers who have undisclosed tax liabilities can now come forward and uh, disclose the tax, pay the principal tax, and get a waiver on penalties and interest. For those of us who are in, the, in this profession a few years back, we had a similar program back in 2004 and 2005 that was a tax amnesty on all taxes, and taxpayers had um, a, a chance to, 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 to disclose their unpaid tax liability and get a, a waiver of the penalties and the interest. So this is a, a short-term measure that most governments, uh, in, uh, I mean, uh, embrace just to make sure that they're able to cash in on tax revenue in the medium term. I know it's not a, a measure that they would want to have it in, in our tax law as a, as a long-term program because it somehow discourages tax compliance. As you're aware, tax compliance is voluntary, so therefore the taxpayers who've been voluntarily paying their taxes may find that uh, they're being discriminated against because the non-compliant taxpayers are kind of being rewarded through the tax disclosure program. So this is a tax um, short-term measure it will run for five year, uh, for three years, beginning 1st of January 2021, and we will be targeting undisclosed tax liabilities um, for the last uh, five years, up to 1st of July 2020. So the taxpayer will come forward, uh, disclose the unpaid tax liability, enter into an arrangement with KRA, and pay over the principal tax, and then they will get a waiver of the penalties and the interest. There is uh, an incentive to take up the program next year, such that uh, a taxpayer who takes up the program soonest will get a 100% waiver on the uh, interest and penalty, and then if they take it up in the second year, 50%, and if they take it up uh, in the third year, you only qualify for, for 25% uh, waiver of the interest and the penalties. But what we've seen uh, in th the way the provision is worded, there are some taxpayers who will not be eligible for this program. The first group of taxpayers is the ones who are under audit or investigations by KRA, or they have uh, received a letter of intention to audit. Uh, we find that the second category is a bit uh, not, uh, not a very welcome move because we know in practice our revenue authority has been issuing several intentions to audit where the audits never take place. So in our submissions to Treasury, we told them to uh, I mean, get, uh, get rid of this new provision to encourage uptake of the program. So uh, what will happen is that uh, once uh, a settlement agreement is agreed with KRA, the matter will be deemed as closed. But however, where a taxpayer um, um, does not disclose material facts and KRA is aware of that uh, situation, then they'll be able to recoup whatever benefit that the taxpayer enjoyed under the program. The critical thing is that a taxpayer cannot come forward and try to uh, claim a tax refund through this program. So the, uh, the program is just expected to yield more tax, um, tax revenue to, to the Kenya Revenue Authority. From a miscellaneous fees and levies act, there were a few proposals in the bill. And the first one is that um, the bill proposes to increase the rate of import declaration fee and import duties on uh, goods imported under the East African Community due to rem remission scheme, the current rate is 10,000, but the proposed rate is 1.5 for the customs value. Additionally, uh, import there will be an additional import duty payable in respect of goods entered in respect for home use from an export process processing zone, and the proposed rate is 2.5% of the customs value. So what, what this would do is that, of course, it will increase the cost of goods that are being uh, cleared through customs, and it's possible that manufacturers may pass over the cost to consumers. 
Uh, listening to the CS yesterday, he talked about uh, some customs duties proposals which have been agreed at regional level, although we have not yet uh, received the Gazette notice. But looking at his speech, he had a few tax measures that are targeted to the manufacturing industry, and notable ones are like to the metal sector. There's um, an agreement to stay off application of the CET rate to apply the 35% rate on imported iron and steel products for another one year. And the rationale behind that is that to, is to protect local manufacturers from cheap imports of, of the items. In the paper sector, a similar proposal, there's a stay of application of the CET rate to apply 25% rate on imported paper and paperboard products. And uh, the, the CS said that Kenya has sufficient capacity to produce paper and paperboard products. To the leather and footwear sector, almost a similar proposal because there will be a stay of application of the CET rate to apply the higher of 25% at Warram rate or the specific import duty rate on imported manufactured leather and uh, footwear. And uh, the reasoning for this was that there's abundance of locally available materials, uh, I mean, uh, to, to manufacture this product. And uh, there's of also the, um, the issue of protection of our local, our local manufacturers, and of course, to safeguard government revenue by curbing under valuations for customs purposes. In the power and utility sector, there will be a steal of application of the 25% CET rate and to apply a 35% rate on imported manufactured electrical parts and accessories for one year. And the rationale here is to protect the local producers. And uh, in, um, uh, I mean, Phyllis talked about the baby diapers manufacturers. This is a welcome move because there will be a duty remission on imports inputs used to manufacture baby diapers so that now i mean look uh, we can make available local capacity to manufacture the same products for those of us who are consumers of these products we know most of them are imported so this is a welcome move in the apparel and, cl and uh, clothing manufacturers there will be uh, some duty remission on dutable inputs used in the manufacture of textile and apparel sector and this is to promote local production of new clothing and apparels uh, including fashion and design. Moving on to the COVID war, uh, PPE manufacturers will get a remission on raw materials and inputs for manufacture of masks, sanitizers, ventilators, and such like products. And this is, uh, of course, to curb uh, the COVID-19 uh, spread. And then from a long-term perspective, there is a policy change in the East African Community, Community Customs Management Act to exempt from import duty supplies for diagnosis, prevention, treatment, and management of epidemics and pandemics. So this is a long-term measure such that now, uh, I mean, uh, when we have such calamities, then uh, we'll be, I mean, uh, importers of such products will be able to benefit from uh, the duty exemption. Trevor, I don't want to stop there. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for breaking it down, Ms. Rachel Njoguna. Mostly what I've picked from that is the government is giving with one hand and taking with the other. That is the main conversation that we are having here on manufacturing. So let me bring in the rest of our panelists. Mr. Mushai Kunye is with us, Kenya Association of Manufacturers Vice Chair. And Mr. Kwame Owino, also CEO, Institute of Economic Affairs. Hadija Nanyomo, Partner, Indirect Taxes, Ernest and Young Limited is also with us. And Ms. Jane Dungo, Safal Group External Affairs Manager, East Africa. So before we get into the nitty gritties of how much this benefits the manufacturing sector, Kwame, I'd like to hear from you first. We know now it's a 2.7 trillion shillings budget, a third of it, about 940 is debt payment, 1.8 billion recurrent expenditure. Development has been given just about half a trillion shillings. Does this budget address the current needs of the country from where you stand before we look into the manufacturing sector? Okay, first, Trevor, I think we need to be clear about the account. The, the, the total public expenditure is not 2.7 trillion. Mm -hmm. It's actually 3.2. Yeah. The 500 plus on the side represents money the government is using to redeem debt. So yeah. Because it's an obligation, so it's not considered part of discretionary spending. So it's it's the part of government that, that it's a part of public spending that there's no discretion upon. Mm -hmm. So I think um, basically, so it can't shift. So uh, the total spending is actually 3.2 trillion. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so coming to your question about um, is it enough? Look, the only thing that I can say, and I understand the circumstances are very, very uh, difficult. Yeah. But the only thing is that we've had just move the microphone closer. We've had a recession you. that's coming. I yeah. mean, that's here. Yeah. And um, and this is the most difficult moment the world has faced globally for like a hundred years. Mm -hmm. 
but we are budgeting like we are budgeting in any regular year with just a few shillings thrown here to manufacturing and all that. Uh, so this is probably uh, a budget that should have been done differently and, and, and understand entirely the, the circumstances. So that's first. The second point is you're right. Of all the amount of money that's uh, available to spend, 904 billion shillings. So let me give you, if the collection is 1.8, which I think is a bit ambitious, possible perhaps, but um, ambitious in my view. Uh, so that means you're collecting about 5, 5, 5 billion, 5.3, 5.4 billion per, per day. Yeah. Of that, 2.4 billion per day is payment to, to, to payment away for, for, for debt. So what this tells us is, because of what has happened over the last five or six years, the pandemic here t reminds us that at all times it's important to have a well-managed economy and do not exhaust your space in terms of borrowing money. Mm. So that when you face a situation such as this, you then you have springs to actually expand debt and to use it for, because the, the need for broad spending has actually been available. Even if the economy cannot, uh, rather even if the revenues will not come in, yeah. this is the point at which we should have expanded debt so that you're able to make payments. So obviously not sufficient, but I mean, it's, we must not be ungenerous. The point is, because of what has happened over the last five years, mm. uh, the kind of spring we have to respond, uh, to respond robustly to this, uh, uh, to this crisis is actually limited. Okay. And I think that's going to show for a while. And that might, I say might, as Phyllis said, might affect our ability to actually, uh, rather, a national uh, economic ability to actually spring back quickly. Okay. So even if the virus, and I think its effects will not stay for long because people will adapt, but its shock on the economic side might be much, much longer because government has less fiscal space, as we call it, less space to, to expand debt mm -hmm. and then to use that to cover everything. Okay. So that's it. Thanks. M Mr. Dija, what do you make of the budget that has just been read out? Um, just like Kwame has said, the, 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 the budget this year is a bit unique. We are seeing so much happening, the, the COVID-19, the locust invasion, the, yeah. the floods. But, but one thing that caught my attention is the theme. The theme is very rosy, stimulating the economy to safeguard livelihoods, jobs, businesses, and industrial recovery. When I read that, I, I, I kind of get excited. It makes me feel optimistic that we are going to, to get there. But, um, and, and again, when I go deeper into the, the budget statement itself, we have the eight-point stimulus, we have the post-COVID-19 recovery strategy, and you know all the allocations to universal health, uh, the rest of the other uh, big four agenda. Uh, w what really strikes me there is um, revenue mobilization didn't come out so, so clearly. The numbers are there, but if, we, if, we, we, if I put it into the context of... Um, how our resource mobilization has been in the past, and the fact that total public expenditure is, is double the current targeted revenue collections, the actuals of KRA. I'm just wondering, all these numbers we've put down, are we really realistic that we are going to be able to implement this budget in the current circumstances we are in? And uh, with the, the, the heat we've already got, and the fact that the economy is going to be hit for the longer term. That, that's when I read what is on paper and what is actually going to happen, I, I, I get a bit pessimistic in that, in that way. Thank you. Okay. Miss Jane, is that the same position for you? Are you optimistic or pessimistic based on what has been read out? Uh, thank you very much. From my side, I listened to the budget and I listened to it with two lenses. Mm. One lens is that we are dealing with a period that we have not encountered before. So we are spending more money to handle something that was not planned. So definitely that gives a, an extra shock to the pockets of the government. Number two, we are also dealing with a budget that is trying to address so many, many uh, programs. We are looking at the Big Four agenda, which has been there for some time. We are looking at the eight-point economic stimulus program. We are looking at the development of a recovery strategy. When you read through all those programs, you feel like there's some repetitiveness. Uh, there is uh, addressing of the youth in almost all of them, addressing of women, youth, and persons with disabilities. And my question was, 
we could have just said for the youth, these are all the things that we want to do for them so that it's clear whether we are injecting enough to address joblessness, whether we are, we are addressing enough to pick the skills that have been lying out there for a long time. Then we go to the women, then we go to persons with disabilities. Otherwise, it feels like you have all these fancy named programs handling the same, same, same issues and confusing us, the taxpayers, even more. Number two, I do feel like also all those programs had a heavy leaning to the SMEs. Yet when you look at the contribution to the, to the exchequer, it comes from the big manufacturers. But when you look at the incentives that have been given to the big manufacturers, what exactly the big manufacturers have gotten. Yet the percentage of what goes into KRA really comes from the big manufacturers. So that was the, the other reaction I had. The other reaction is we have seen um, a, a lot of input into the primary education, secondary education, uh, to the universities and to the TVETs. But I see a, a delink between the skills that shall come out at that level and what the employers are looking for. So I would have expected some kind of incentives uh, or enhancement of the existing incentives to the employers to be able to pick up those skills. Because we are talking about 1.7 million jobs that are, that are lost. How are we going to bring them back? If we don't bring them back, those are skills that, are, that will start rusting and they'll not be useful by the end of the year. Uh, on the bid for uh, competitiveness, we have talked a lot about illicit trade. I would have expected to see injection of considerable budgets to all the agencies that are handling illicit trade. We are talking about goods coming in, substandard goods coming in. We are also looking at a period where um, manufacturers in other Asian countries, for example, are ahead of us in recovery from the COVID period. So we are bound to see more products coming from that side into our market. They may not be up to standard or they may not uh, fulfill most of the requirements that we need. So I expected to see injection in that area so that when we are securing our borders from uh, security from criminals we are also securing them from entry of illicit products into the market and that is one area that you're seeing the manufacturing sector is losing a lot for what we can produce and provide to the market is coming through uh, the porous borders all right <laughs> well that's a very elaborate breakdown of it all mishai what are your preliminary thoughts on this budget so far especially to the manufacturing sector okay i think overall uh like has been said before the context is very difficult um just given where we are and you know that, that's been expounded a lot um if we compare what has been happening in our businesses and we you know we represent businesses what people are actually doing in their businesses Whatever people had planned before for the year, they have shelved it and said, now this is new circumstances, it's a new world, unprecedented, and so on. So we need to start thinking anew. So I think to some extent, um, conversely probably, is like the, the budget actually lacked some ambition in terms of how much are we changing. If we go for just business as usual, it's almost like we haven't quite understood the context and what the impact of uh, the pandemic is going to be on very many uh, levels. Yes, I think the challenge is there because income is going to be reduced and there's going to be a challenge and yet there's expenditure that has to be made. Uh, primarily, we've talked about things like health. We can't really um, avoid that. We need to do that so that we can survive. But perhaps the, the budget would have been looking at, let's just make it through this year. Let's focus more a little bit about what we need to do this year and divert revenues whatever revenues we get on to say the just a, f a few priority areas rather than spreading it too too wide given that we are we are actually in in challenging times so there i think the understanding of the context becomes uh yeah a little bit more challenging 
And then, um, like you've mentioned and alluded to, I think one of the things we are looking for from a manufacturing point of view is some level of coherence in the, I think is the way I would call it, is because you, are, you get with one hand, uh, or we say we want to do something, but we are doing uh, the opposite in, in the actual um, details of the, of the budget. Whatever you've put in there is not going to help us with it. And then I think there's an element of complexity we need to start discussing about. Because if we keep adding new taxes, we are adding complexity to what manufacturers need to do. So I think, um, like we heard from the EY presenter, the minimum tax, how it's going to be calculated is a problem. If we say VAT, we are now required, or the proposal is that we are required to confirm that the, our suppliers have paid their VAT as well. Yeah. You are adding complexity to businesses, which is not useful for what we are going to be doing. And finally, is a sense of consistency. Uh, one of the challenges has been we get a benefit. We've got a couple. We've got like we had an energy rebate we were getting. People have only used it for one year, hardly used it for one year because they'll be making their returns this, this month, at the end of this month, and it's gone again. We have uh, things like for... Um, the beer, the use of maltings for, from sorghum and millet and so on. Um, you know, that consistency is so important for investment. People cannot make investments if they are not clear uh, what happens. And I think long term what happens is that, uh, especially in the international market, in the investor market, the government starts to lose its credibility because it starts becoming like, yes, you promise this, but are you going to be able to drive through that for a long period. Yeah. Uh, another example there was the um, investment deductions that we had. And we've been, uh, we had our incentive of 150% investment deduction to go out to the, if you're in the counties and building out in the counties. Now, if you remove that, one, the incentive to go into a county, uh, it just goes down. Mm -hmm. Because one of the reasons it was there is because the infrastructure is, is lower, you're gonna have to provide more ETC. But it's also very important, especially when it comes to your borrowing and your cash flows, how you're going to be able to pay back for the investment that you're doing. Yeah. So th some of those things become a challenge, and uh, I guess we'll be discussing more as we go along. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you're joining us live, we're on Facebook and YouTube as well. Use the hashtag BudgetKE2020 and come live to get in touch with us. What I like to do usually is pose the challenges and then get into the solutions. And Kwame, that's where we should now begin, because as it stands right now, just our deficit alone is at around 7.3% of our GDP, which was, is actually bigger than the projected growth because initially it was a 5.4%. Now it's been revised to 2.5%. So we are still way out of that based on our deficit. We now know that the G government is looking to borrow 349 billion externally, 486 billion from the domestic market, essentially crowding out the same manufacturers who would have gone to the banks to get some money to open up their businesses are we shooting ourselves in the foot because there seems to be no camaraderie or symphony in the government elections and what should they do then what should they have done you know um i, I think when you started you mentioned that um, in, in 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 the budget spending this year 904 billion shillings will be paid out as part redemption and also mm -hmm. interest for debts that have come from before the first thing that does is as it actually reduces flexibility in the budget mm -hmm. uh, basically uh, spending flexibility is out because uh, if already revenues are expected to be uh, 1.87 trillion and half of that straight away is going to to paying debt so obviously you have very little space to to spend so that's what this tells you is how budgets and how public uh, revenues are connected year by year and, and I think it, it, it emphasizes something that Mushai mentioned before us we cannot have public budgets or treasury secretaries, fine, they change, <laughs> but they cannot work as if this economy runs on a, you know, on, a, on, 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 on that calendar basis. People make investments that they think will pay off in 11 years or seven years. So if you're changing the rules for them every one year, um, I think you, you just make a mess of everything for, for and, and in terms of planning. So the way government should also plan or think about it is to say, look, if our intention is to reduce this tax or to provide an incentive for somebody to make an investment. How long does the average investment take to pay? And it's usually seven, eight years. And that's for very successful businesses. Some people require 13, 14 years before they actually recover the capital and they can start to pay. So if you intend to invite investment, then that so so that that kind of decent behavior is actually required. Because otherwise you're just sending signals all over. 
And the business environment is becoming too complex for people to manage, in addition to just the paperwork that you know they have to do and uh, everything else. I think as Kenyans, we have to accept that, look, your average business person is not the kind of guy who can shut the business and leave tomorrow. Let's have more faith and trust in these guys. So if you give them an incentive, let it lock. Just lock it in by telling them that, look, we have given this incentive. Even if we have a deficit, the first thing we will try and do is we know over seven years that when your business matures and you're now making your payments, then we can actually do that, uh, that kind of, of thing. But this whistle stop, whistle start, whistle stop, I think it's, it's, it's partly what also damages government's budgets. Because then you are the same people who have taken uh, capital investments and have now raised money to be able to, 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 to extend that business are now competing with the same government who pays a lower interest rate to actually grab the money from the same banks. So really, when you say you want to, the economy to recover, are you surprised that businesses have not been creating as much employment in the public, I mean, in the formal or modern sector, and everybody's running back here? Because no business person is going to lock in uh, costs that you cannot shift, such as labor. You have to pay people every month. Um, and so if you give somebody a contract last year because you expect him to be here for three years, and then the very, very, very concessions that you are banking on to be able to actually raise money to be able to pay them have been shifted this year. What are you saying? Uh, you're making contracts shorter and shorter and making work le casualized and less formal. So I think this connected thinking is something the public sector in Kenya. And let me, let me give you a radical example. My view is that the government of Kenya should give farm instruction, I mean farm signal to business people. We intend to keep the income tax and pay this stable for the next five years. Um, and you can say that that means we have these losses, but the way we help to recover them is for you people to actually use this opportunity. Because then you know how to balance your capital side and you know how to balance your recurrent expenditures. And that's how businesses make decisions. Even small institutions such as the one I work for is not a business per se, but basically we have business planning. That's how you make decisions. So I think Treasury must take responsibility for this together with 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 uh, with uh, with um, with the Parliament. Yeah. If last year's Finance Act asked businesses to take a certain concession and you are choosing it, you should admit that you are wrong and either compensate people for act actually creating losses for them because signals that's what signals are, yeah. or simply say that. We don't know what we are doing, and that's bad <laughs> for Treasury to actually say that we didn't know what we were doing They're last year. Ago. Blind. I mean, just uh, just a year ago. It's yeah. bad. These guys plan for 30 years, yeah. Vision 2030, but you can't plan between one and two years and keep things stable. Yeah. It's it, it's a real whatever. And my view is, perhaps the president is the one who should respond to this. The cabinet, but but Parliament has to say every time you change taxes now, you must lock them in for at least five years. Yeah. That means people can't. So yeah. But what about the crowding out effect of them borrowing locally? What options did they have? Should they have gone for concessional loans? Or are you simply saying we should have lived within our means so that we don't have to borrow? Okay. Uh, 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 um, a moment where you have growth rates and the shocks that we have. And you know those shocks are not just domestic. I mean, the, the low costs and the floods are domestic. Mm -hmm. But the global ones, as you've had, supply chains, I mean, as a... Uh, as, uh, Phyllis mentioned, for some manufacturing firms, and I guess for businesses, your supply chains were disrupted. So even if you're still able to pay, costs went up because everybody was competing for the same same stuff, but also because for some time China was blocked, whether it was Poland, wherever it is you buy your stuff, people couldn't send things. So obviously your costs went up and you also had to wait. In addition to that, you had to wait. Uh, uh, so, so under that, those circumstances, this is where government should actually expand debt if you have credibility globally and domestically. You can expand debt by a huge margin, lock in a lot of money for the, mid, for the medium to long term, and then use that to support everything else. But here, you do, they don't, I mean, we don't have treasury, let me just say government, because it's not just treasury. We don't have that option because we already borrowed to the hilt. Uh, so every borrowing that you do is at actually more expensive rates because people know for every one shilling, I mean, for every one shilling you're collecting, right, 48 cents, no, actually, 49, almost for half, is going directly to your debtors. So they know it. And even banks know it. They know government will have to lend. So even if they are competing on the, on the auction with the CBK, they know it. I, I, I mean, it's OK. They know it that if you don't give them good rates, they can keep up. I mean, after two months, you're desperate. And you just hike it up so that you can get that money. So they know it. So the point is, that's water under the bridge, to yeah. be honest. But the main thing is, you're competing with farms at the wrong time, but because government doesn't have other options for cash, yeah. it means you have to 
you have to compete with businesses, which is really, really sad. Yeah, and that essentially crowds out the people who are Certainly. supposed to get the money. Mr. Dija, what are the solutions from where you stand? What should we have prioritized and how should we have fixed it? To even spur just the economic growth after people say post-COVID-19, post COVID because nobody knows what that looks like really. For me, I think first and foremost, th this seems uh, cliche, but it's, it, it may not be. I think we need to be healthy. First of all, we need to be alive. <laughs> for okay. us to do anything. <laughs> so I think government, first of all, needs to ensure that we are all healthy. We are not losing so many people to this, to this uh, epidemic. And we are there to be able to continue. And the reason I brought it up is that I thought it was something uh, maybe not very real. But when I heard that we've lost the former president of uh, Burundi, the incoming president is in ICU. The mother has died. I knew that a whole cabinet can go down. We, when you look at South Sudan, the whole cabinet is almost down. So how is the economy going to run? So I think health is very important. And um, I, I've seen in the budget allocations, they've given it quite a big chunk. Is it 100 and s around 117 billion? And uh, if we really put focus on that and ensure that everyone is healthy, that should really help bring back the economy. But I also think uh, a, a, a conducive business environment could help. And here, let's, let's for, for a minute, move away from uh, the tax incentives and uh, the, 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 the beat around the fiscal in terms of tax. We, we, we need government to start thinking beyond the tax because, like we've been saying, it gives with one hand and takes with the other. Let's look at more you know, feasible and more actual contributions like subsidies issues to do with subsidies, rebates, um, working on PPPs would work well if they are well structured, whereby the public works with the private sector because the private sector brings the professionalism, the public, the public sector will bring in the funding. That could also spur the economy. And, um, and, and also, um, I, I, I would say if we take advantage of what COVID has brought to us, because I know most businesses, most of us are on our toes. We are doing things we never thought we've done, things that have never been in our business plans. I would imagine if we get support and take that on board, it would help. Uh, I also look at um, the Africa continental free trade area, the fact that other countries were badly beaten and um, they are a bit locked. We are starting to think that it's time to start doing intra-Africa trade more seriously. So that could also help us because I'm seeing there are many uh, industries supplying masks, PPP, PPEs, sanitizers. That could as well go to other countries that are not really manufacturing. So those are the few I can think about yeah. uh, improving the, and uh, bringing us back to back recovery. On our feet. Mm -hmm. All right. Ms. Ndugan, what do you think? From where you stand, how should we have cultured this budget to make sure that it addresses the needs of the people? One, one thing I, I want to say is that we are dealing with uh, a budget that runs for just 12 months. So for all intents and purposes, that's a short, short term period. So the government would have uh, shown commitment to, to cut or to state some serious austerity measures. I think from Listening to the government, I didn't hear any particular heavy austerity measures that they intend to take to bring down public expenditure. Number two, uh, this being just 12 months uh, budget, I would have expected a delay in some of the infrastructure, infrastructure projects that we are, not, we are not in a hurry to utilize. For example, a lot of money has been pumped for the SGR phase two project, yet we are still um, slippery about the first SGR project. It has not addressed a lot of uh, the noise that we have heard from the various sector players, whether it is from the trucking, uh, the companies uh, who do freight on road, or the companies that feel they have been sort of forced to use the the SGR, all those uh, 
issues have not been handled, but we are quick to go to the second phase of the SGR project. So in my thoughts, I would have thought the government would have made a conscious effort to delay some of those heavy infrastructure uh, projects. And number three, I also felt that the government is heavily reliant on the actions of the private sector to generate revenue. However, they are not uh, also helping the private sector get out of the exchequer what is owed. We have a lot of VAT refunds. I must recall that the president on 25th of March talked about releasing the VAT refunds, but it has been a pain just getting that money out of um, the exchequer. So my imagination is that the, the, the budget would have uh, provided relief to the private sector to ensure that not only 10 billion, but much more comes out to go and help, uh, to cushion the private sector, to help them with their cash flows, to help them retain the jobs, because that's one solution of retaining uh, the jobs. We don't have to, to suffer more job losses. So uh, that, that is one area I would have uh, expected to hear a bit more energy from the CS yeah. on the steps they are going to take. Can I yeah. say something about the VAT refunds? Yes, go ahead. Um, um, I, I practice in tax, but I, I've started, just like corruption has found its way into the, the budget allocations, I don't know why VAT refunds is also finding its way in budget allocations. Because the way, the way technically how VAT is supposed to work, you sell your goods, you pay output tax, which you're collecting as an agent. Then the person who has incurred that, that VAT goes and claims it. And someone has already taken it to government. So when it goes to government, why should it first go away, then come back, and then now that, that, that topic is taking a full page of the budget speech, like they're doing anyone a favor, they're doing the taxpayers a favor to give them back what they actually paid and what government took and probably allocated wherever. And now it's turning like we are even hoping for it. Jen is really <laughs> praying for it. You know, you've gone and, and really spent money which should get back to you. And it was actually and legitimately it's, it's within government. Mm -hmm. And now it has come to, to a point where it is a, a privilege. The, everyone is being uh, given a, a, a privilege to get it back. It is even going on to allocations. I, I, I find that quite something I, I don't understand, <laughs> and I know about how other countries do it. I don't find it fair, and I don't see what business it has in a budget reading. I don't see what business it has for a president, for a CS to stand up and say this money must be budgeted for. It must come out. It's an inflow and outflow which we need to get discipline and start ensuring that when the administrators collect it, it goes back to the right people. We have, we have IT systems, we have the ITAC system. It is supposed to correct this automatically. The accounts are there and all this. So for me, I find it ridiculous that we sit here from the president to the CS to taxpayers begging, discussing the issue of VAT refund. It's just <laughs> totally unacceptable. <laughs> Michelle, what do, you, what do you make of it? And it's interesting because that was also bringing the issue of pending bills. Yeah, because first of all, the reason they're pending is because they, was, they should have been budgeted for. They should have been paid, but they've not been paid. Now it's a whole line for the budget planning again. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, I have to agree with what uh, DJ is saying. And we have been actually advocating for some sort of uh, amendment to maybe the VAT Act or the, I think it's the public finance bill that needs to be amended, where the VAT that the, before KRA sends VAT to Treasury, it needs to have deducted whoever is supposed to get a refund so that they are sending them the net VAT, not uh, like it's going to be paid later. At the moment, we estimate the government owes about a hundred billion in withholding VAT beyond the, these are the VAT refunds. There's a huge amount that they owe uh, members. And I think I just want to also reiterate the point is that you owe the money. You know, it, it belongs to 
people have it is like it's almost unauthorized borrowing in that sense because you've taken the money and it's not there's no interest on it and that liquidity is important for business i think um, one of the things we've begun to understand and it's not just only from government it's also in private sector the importance of liquidity if you owe somebody money and you pay them it enables them to go do uh, the next piece of business or whatever else they were going to do, whether they were going to invest. Even if they were just going to pay profit to their uh, shareholders, that profit would then be used somewhere else. They might invest it in a, in a bank to lend it to somebody else who has a business. They might even invest it in treasury bills to help fund the government. But the, the importance of that money circulating is very critical. So I think here, the main thing also on the, um, on the budget and given the context where we were, is I think the protection of jobs. And I think we've talked, we've talked about lives and livelihoods. Yeah. So lives might be health, livelihoods is is economy now. And how we, and of course the two are linked. So to my, myself, I also think sometimes we separate them too much, but if we don't have livelihoods, we will not have lives sooner. Or our lives will start uh, diminishing. Um, so there were steps that were taken, especially at the beginning, we were very appreciative, like the reduction in income tax for individuals. And the goal there was that, look, let's put more money in people's pockets. That money they can then use. Because at the moment, nobody is going to be taking money to save or necessarily to go buy plots or other things. Right now, it's just about money for survival and to keep the economies growing. So we were thinking that, look, help liquidity. Let's keep uh, money circulating. That's why you're reducing the tax. But now I think that the view has been taken sometimes from Treasury, which I, we talk about the coherence and the consistency, is like we've taken money from them, uh, which they were going to take. I think you were talking about 172 billion lost <laughs> in <laughs> revenue, right? But the idea is that if we give this um, money to an employee, a manufacturer, one of our employees in our manufacturing site, he will go to the shop, he's going to buy sugar, he's going to buy something, and that will create VAT. And that VAT will end up going back to, back to them. They will buy different things, and it will go back to government. So the idea is just about where are you uh, getting your revenue from? How is revenue going to grow so that uh, the economy grows? We understand government expenditure growing, I think, but I'll take what um, uh, my other colleagues were saying. We need to think about how fast is government expenditure growing and what is it being spent for. Uh, but understanding it will grow. But it will. Our, we will be able to give them more taxes when we are growing our wealth, when we are growing our productivity. So the challenge we have always with things like the minimum tax, you are creating, you are trying to create new additional taxes without necessarily helping us to become more productive. Yes. Because what we should be looking at, how do we get, if we are worried about corporate tax uh, in uh, earnings, we need to be thinking about why are our businesses less profitable? How do we make them profitable so that they can then pay more tax? And then, again, we can't focus only on, on the corporate tax that a company pays. We need to look at how many people are they employing? Okay, uh, are they paying, uh, they're paying IDF, RDL, they're paying um, uh, rates and rent and other taxes. So we, there's a lot of uh, additional value add to the economy rather than just this corporate tax that we're paying. So the minimum corporate tax especially, I think will be, will be very difficult. At this time, when companies are going to be making losses, or, and we know already we've got uh, among our members, people who are really struggling, we know there are people at home because they've been you know, followed or laid off because there is no money to pay them. Those companies, as if this law is passed, will be required to pay 1% of their turnover as tax. And they, they can't, they're already struggling to pay their employees, uh, to pay rent and to pay other things. But then we are being asked to pay again. Uh, again, at 1%, it demands that your net profit would be 4%. You know, because we are now at 25% corporate tax. If you're being asked to pay 1% of turnover, it assumes your profit should always be 4%. Otherwise, you're paying some minimum tax. And n that's not the case for all industries and, and many businesses. And uh, you know the, the impact will be there, not just in manufacturing. I was just thinking about, say, Kenya Airways. Yeah. 
uh, are we now going to require Kenya Airways to pay a minimum tax on its what 140 billion of turnover? And we know it is loss make. I mean, it's like th this could be the nail, killing a lot of businesses, killing a lot of employment. So I think timing-wise and even the structure of it is just ill-advised. This is COVID time. We need to survive. Yeah. And it's interesting, Kwame, what is raising in terms of this being interesting times that we live in and let's talk about the eight-point agenda the stimulus package that the president recently announced three billion of that is going really to the tourism industry and a bit of hotels here does it make sense to pump in three billion shillings in an industry that is operating at zero occupancy right now or is this just a matter of just making sure people stay afloat because what is the long-term plan you pump in the money in there, they're just paying salaries, there's no occupancy. Okay, um, I, mean, I have to differ with some of my colleagues who actually thought that the stimulus program is well designed. I think it's very poorly designed. Um, look, the nature, of an, the nature of an economy is that there's interconnection. So for instance, all, or with the exception of, uh, uh, all manufacturers actually need logistics, which is a, which is a, which is a service to be able to, you know, um, uh, bring back, bring in inputs, take the inputs out, and do all manner of things. Uh, so this idea that you're trying to save an industry by thinking about tourism, and you're thinking about tourism as tourists coming and sitting in a hospitality place and, you know, stuff like that, it's, it's not connected thinking. So the whole economy has suffered a dent. Um, tourism is very obvious because it had two linking industries. One was transport, obviously. If flights can't take place, and then secondly, people cannot travel because of physical distancing that's necessary, it's most evident. It does not mean that it's the only sector that has suffered. And to try to take choices like that actually creates further structural damage. So what government should have done is simply say, ladies and gentlemen, we have 100 billion here under concessionary terms for you to take. Whatever sector you are in, let your business managers prepare a plan for yourselves, payable, say, over three or four years, and then you can claim that money and somebody makes a decision and send it out by speed. Now, that will happen. So you can save tourism, you can save the tourism industry, but there are suppliers who are MSEs supplying their physical goods and supplying their, sorry, uh, doing, say, the, their washing, providing their sheets, providing the, the food, are not, then it doesn't. So that's the absence of the connected thinking that I'm thinking government means well, <laughs> but it's not designing the program properly. So let me tell you what, if I was government, I could have, I could have done. I mean, and usually at the IEA, we try not to make government spend money because we think, I think that's a bad way to throw money at problems, at issues. But the way to have actually have that is we should have told all, all, all firms right now. There's such a big problem, especially if you're working in a manufacturing sector. Fine, unless you're using very highly industrialized, and some of them are in Kenya where you have robots or whatever and everything else, and it's mechanical. But many of them actually need, if you're in a paint factory, for instance, which I visited um, just before this closed, one of the things is people work uh, cheek to jowl, basically, because the processes are so controlled that someone has to be next to the other to actually see how the colors mix, how this, did and that. Now, that kind of guy cannot bring back his workers, whatever happens, because they need to work so closely. And what do they need? They need to test. They cannot test all their 40 workers because the reagents are not available. If I was government, this is how you design an incentive. You say Kenya's private sector, the entire pipeline of all the stuff that's required, you know, to do the test, that gross thing, <laughs> to do the test and all the reagents and everything right up to the pipeline. Part of it is manufacturing, part of it is logistics, part of it is service. Tell manufacturers, guys, if you're able to arrange a facility that can test 10,000 people per day, right? Here is money for you to claim. Do you know what that does? They organize around who does the manufacturing, the cotton bud. Some of them are manufactured in Kenya. They'll do it. The other guys will do the transportation. But you say, I want you guys to meet 10,000 per day. Remember, we are testing 1,000. Mm -hmm. If they can ramp it up like that, it does two things. The import substitution takes place, right? But you're actually providing a service so that people can test their workers and bring them back to work quickly. So basically, there are people who have actually lined workers, but they cannot because if they have to come in, in as much as they are in social service, their own workers are saying, but why are you asking me to come, and yet I might be infected and have kids and people at home as well, right? So that's, so the, the point is, these are natural times. So the way to respond is to provide an incentive through businesses. Businesses will respond. If you say, we've put a billion for you guys to do this thing for us, and for a whole year we'll be testing that, somebody will work on that. I know it. Somebody will work on it. Even if they have to import part of it, they'll work on that, because what we have a problem with, it'll help government as well. 
so that the numbers of tests make sense. And you say, you just line up your people, those things will be, will be tested as soon as the tests are done. Most people will get their eyes back one because they know you're safe. Then provide them with a suit, which again comes up through this same manufacturing, uh, manufacturing thing. But we are spending the same money in the same way we've been spending it before when the times have changed. So that's, that's the, even the design of the mechanisms for spending is, is, is what worries me. So yes, when you say we've thrown it at tourism, there's no single industry. Tourism is part food, it's part apparel, it's part even transport. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you think about it in that way, I think that absence of connected thinking, and I know, I mean, people are throwing all manner of proposals at government, that's the truth, but maybe they should have sat back and actually asked us, we are going to spend 2% of GDP, for instance, what do we want to give us the biggest kick? And don't, don't think for businesses by telling them you can use this to refurbish your establishments or do this. Let people actually who run those businesses know yeah. that, look, I have three or four years to be able to actually do this. There's a concession. What's the best way for me to prepare myself? And it'll happen. All you right. have to trust the market. <laughs> because <laughs> okay. these guys know somebody sits every day to be a planner yeah. for a business that pays him, make sure he meets his obligations to his finances and banks and to his shareholders. They're not going to joke with that cash. Mm -hmm. They do the right things as opposed to government telling them, line up like this. Make sure it's 50 people. Yeah. I don't think that's necessary. <laughs> All right. And we having this conversation. We'd like to also welcome you into it. Use the hashtag come live. That's where we can also hear your views on this because this captures all of us. And we said, DJ, talk to me about adaptation. This is what under the bridge now. The budget has been read out. We can just poke holes into it. But how then does the manufacturing industry adapt to the current times? You spoke about the African free continental trade area. At this time, we know we are creating PPEs here locally. So how do we adapt as a manufacturing industry to be able to wave, to ride the wave sort of, of the 20, of COVID-19? I think just like we are seated here today. Just I hold the microphone closer, Shima. I Thank think you. Um, three, four months ago, I mean, six months ago, we couldn't think of something like this. We could be in a, somewhere in a New Stanley or Intercon paying them money and uh, maybe some some uh, manufacturers would have paid to come for this but we are still doing it at a lower you know cost so probably new ways of, uh, of of doing business technology has to come in new manufacturing techniques are things we have to adapt there is no way we, we are going to continue the usual way we've been doing things we we are also looking at new manufacturing opportunities it, 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 I was, the other day I was just thinking, there are many cosmetics companies. That were, it, because about a week when the need for sanitizers came up, they were ready with the sanitizers, but it has never crossed our mind or the business's mind that they could actually produce products in that range. But it took a week and those ideas came up and now probably those are the best selling items on their racks. So those opportunities have to come up. Unfortunately, I'm seeing a bit of restructuring in terms of human capital. Some people may not be needed anymore. So, and that is something, again, I did not feel anywhere in the budget. And it's very important because all these people are going to be laid off. And they are being laid off not because they are incapable, not because they don't have the skills. Where are they going to go and how is government going to support them? How is government going to train them? Do we have enough counseling service service providers? Do we have enough, you know, um, trainers or mentors to put them into business? These are things to think about. Uh, we'll find many manufacturers or businesses have had to now create maybe a new HR or talent group to deal with this group of people. Uh, the legal bit is going to come in a lot. Um, the other thing I'm, I'm thinking may have to happen here to make businesses stronger is uh, mergers and acquisitions. Where I have been small, I can provide this, but uh, Kunika's entity can, can come on board with other opportunities and another angle, it, and then together we capture the market as one and at a bigger level. You can see the impact NC, NIC and uh, CBA Bank has had. There were two smaller banks, and then when they joined, they are now a big force to, to reckon with. And um, I'm also seeing uh, local content. It had been kind of shelved, and um, it was taking long to be implemented. But now, almost all over the budget, and um, the plans and SMEs are really pushing for 
Buy Kenya, Build, Build Kenya initiatives. So all these are things that uh, manufacturers need to embrace. Yeah. We need to start thinking more around how best to raise capital. And this goes into record keeping. We need to ensure that our books are ready to be presented to people who can really give us these, the, the, the credit guarantee schemes, the seed capital that has been put there. It's not like we are going to walk in with no records, you know, no plan. And uh, so record keeping and being ready to embrace these opportunities is a key one for the sector as well. Ms. Ndungo, we are talking about this issue of adaptation, and we now know that the ICT budget really has been cut from 28.3 billion in 2019 to only 14.3 billion this year. Yet the presidency budget has been increased to 36.6 billion from 11.3 billion last year. Without getting into the political nitty gritties of it, and I know that's a place where we want to avoid, the digital tax has also been introduced at a time when we now know most of the jobs are going online. So then how do we adapt when at the same time we're pulling the rugs under the, we're pulling the carpet from underneath the youth who are trying to just make a living digitally? Okay, that's a good question. Um, actually looking at what most companies have done is that uh, they have made it possible for their employees to work from home. And to work from home, you need the um, internet connect connectivity. You need to be able to join Teams or Zoom meetings or whichever, whichever other platform. Number two, we are seeing companies are also moving from physical uh, spaces for selling their products and going on to the e-commerce. So I would think that that would be uh, an ill-advised, almost inverted uh, allocation of the budget because this is a time to boost that, that uh, ICT and making sure that uh, not only uh, do we have it in Nairobi, but we have it further out there. Because then we'll, we'll, we'll have a, a, a very differentiated uh, movement into this ICT platform if somebody in the rural areas is still hearing it like it will come in 2030. So I think uh, they, they would have done much more so that they, they increase the speed at which the, the fiber lane is ongoing in the country, connect as many places as possible, allow people to work from where they are, and even reduce drastically this uh, 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 rural to urban migration. Because it means I don't have to be seated in a physical space for me to undertake some enterprise, uh, some enterprise work. So that's what I would think. Because when you look at most of the companies in their adaptation modeling they have actually moved more to thinking about e-commerce yeah. so that is where we would have seen uh, more support going so that more and more companies can move there almost seamlessly all right so Michelle, is this are we just locked in between a rock and a hard place because for example what Ms. Dungo is bringing up the issue of physical office space now not being that necessary the moment people start working from home then the employer starts wondering so why do i need you exactly and also the office space the impact on real estate will see people starting to think of airbnb office to let so you just meet once in a while if it's really necessary otherwise you're working from home and then the now the work itself will be task oriented rather than the number of days you've put in therefore everybody else will be on contract so either way wh whichever way we adapt there's a sector that's going to lose how do we ensure that everybody stays afloat yeah i think um it's very interesting about about a year ago or two we we're doing an interviews for accountants and one of the candidates had listed her current job as a company in ireland so we were looking at it internally and saying, where is, is she going to have to come back or what's the, what's the story? Then we're like, no, 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 she's in Nairobi. She's their finance uh, manager, but she works from Nairobi. She works online. Yeah. And they recruited her. In fact, I, you know, I was very fascinated. Like, how did you even get the job? But yeah. they recruited her and they did uh, everything. And she was able to do that job from, from Nairobi for a while i guess it was working for an sme so these things have been there what COVID has done is just accelerate the process at which we are going to be able to um to start transferring to some of these things um what happens whenever you have adaptation it's it's the same thing that happened you know 150 years ago when we first got cars 
because there were people who took care of horses. There were people who, you know, who made horse carts and had to breed the horses and to shoe the horses and to do all of those things. And they had to find something else to do. It's the same thing with the railway. It's the same thing with the computers. Um, by the time computers came, people used to write invoices manually and everything. And those jobs change. And that is the adaptation that we require for uh, individuals. Of course, the other thing to think about is that whenever there's an adaptation, it creates a whole new economy for, for jobs and opportunities. I think we know even today we've had a whole, it's been written elsewhere on, you know, a whole cadre of university students and so on, young people who are actually doing digital work online. You know, there are all these portals online, you can go get work. So it actually now means you can work for a company in Dubai, in Thailand, when you're just here, you can do a lot more. So the adaptation, I think what will happen is nobody owes anybody else lunch. That is the one of the things we need to know, whether it's individuals, companies, or governments. Nobody owes you lunch. You then have to start saying, how am I going to be able to react? How, much, how am I going to be able to survive and make an income in the new reality that is here? And to see the opportunities, because the opportunities are there. We've talked about like the, the way companies were able to quickly adapt to sanitizers. The thing about it is that was great, and it shows you the, your adaptability and how quickly you can flex. But what happens, say, say we get a vaccine. We're all vaccinated, COVID is over. Your sanitizer business is gone. Okay? There's no sanitizer business is back to the volumes it was or your face mask business again it's back to where it was before yeah. so you you're going to have to then do something else so it's the state of mind to be able to keep flexible to to be adaptable and to know that nothing stands permanently you're going to have to keep changing have to keep uh, inventing yourself have to keep learning in fact they talk about first it's unlearning what you've done and then learning new things and then we can grow and luckily in Kenya, I think we have the, um, the imagination, the youth, and the energy to do that, yeah. And Kwame, I was speaking to a trade along Gong Road, the people who make furniture, and they're saying that Easy Pesa Mingi, we are seeing, we see a lot of money being thrown at SMEs, and also many, about 600 million for vehicles locally assembled. And they are saying that why don't we start with such basic things, like all government offices should be furnished from right here. The buy Kenya, build Kenya mentality. Is this, if you were given this 600 million, how would you distribute it? Because we know now we're talking about vehicles that are locally manufactured, but we also know the cost of production has not reduced one bit. So how does that then help? Even the common one, NG. Okay, I'm, I mean, I, I have a complicated relationship with buy Kenya, build Kenya. <laughs> uh, because I think um, it's, it's, it's a good initiative, especially for the public sector. Um, but it's my view about it is that if the idea is to actually buy Kenyan goods and, 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 and build Kenyan businesses, that's a good thing. But the way it is rendered sometimes, or the narrative that many Kenyans have the idea for, is that government should choose for us what to wear, what furniture to have at home, and everything else. If you think about buy Kenya, build Kenya, government is a big buyer in Kenya. They're a very, very big buyer. But it doesn't always buy efficiently. So that's why when I have a problem with buy, so the point is, the way for government to actually do it is what, and, and people talk about Singapore and all these other places who had similar initiatives, but the way they used to do it is actually say, what's the best furniture in the world? And then government comes and says, if you can match this standard for the same cost or at least 5% more, then we'll buy from you because of, I mean, get logistics of getting it all the way. So it, has, it must have an efficiency component as opposed to the raw, you know, nationalism is a, form, is a, is a form of tribalism which is saying that, look, we hate you because you're Ugandan, <laughs> or we don't like you because you're this, we'll buy all our calabashes from our village and you guys get lost. So it can actually be used with a competitiveness interest as opposed to locking markets for specific people. So that's, 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 that's an imperative. How would I spend 600 million? If you ask me by the um, I wouldn't be speaking about uh, government offices. I'd be thinking about the biggest infrastructure footprint that the government of Kenya has, and which is a positive one, is schools. Schools and colleges together are about 30,000 units. If you count one school as one, 30,000 units, right? Kids have to go back to school at one point or another. I mean, parents are desperate, and it's right. We did, we are doing a, we are writing a case study now for uh, the IE, and we found out that there's a school 
in five kilometers from Kisumu town, 3,001 students, seven teachers, I mean, sorry, 74 teachers, right? Only nine washing places, of which three are for teachers, six for kids. Do you know, before you even get to the infrastructure, so if I was a business person, manufacturing, say, look, we would supply tanks to every school, government should pay for it. Because irrespective of whether we get a vaccine or not, and I probably think we will, we must have better sanitation. If there's one thing that this shock has shown us is sanitation problems in Kenya are terrible. We can build a fancy train, but if our kids can't wash their hands, it's rubbish. So we were speaking to a teacher, a deputy teacher from the school, just called her. And she said, even if I asked my kids to line up and assume each of them uses 25, 25 seconds, <laughs> right? I'd have to put like 20 teachers for two hours to make sure all the kids have washed their hands. Do, do, do you see what that means? And these are things government can solve by creating a market, saying, look, tank, guys who can provide tanks, you can do this. Every school, supply them with five, ten tanks, then let's talk about the water. That's a manufacturing opportunity, but it's also serving a purpose. It's not buy Kenya, build Kenya as an end in itself. So these things have to be intelligently designed. So if I was at 600 million, it's not enough, but I would say we'll rank all the schools, look at pupil-teacher ratio, how many water points they have, and say we will double those water points within the next three months. Manufacturers, roll out the tanks, roll out the pipes, roll out everything else. We will buy from you, provided you can do that. And then you'll have local fundies or somebody else to install them, right? So that kids can wash hands. Because even if kids go back today to school, the sanitation problems will be terrible. That's what my fear is. Thanks. And Mujai, you're directly involved in this before I go to Mr. Dija. How would you deal with it? The 600 million that we're talking about, the Buy Kenya, Build Kenya. And this is an initiative that has been there for a while. Yeah. Is it even working from the people you talk to? So I think it's partially working and it's a good incentive. I think where government is looking at uh, what can we buy locally and seriously looking at it. Because in some cases, we've come across even tenders which are designed to exclude uh, local production. So I think it's a good thing and it will help us uh, in manufacturing grow. But I do agree with what Kwame is saying. And uh, just to add to it is the question of competitiveness. Because also, if we take our other side of it as taxpayers, we've got to ask, is the government going to buy more expensive things or the best quality at the best price? Because again, whether it's water tanks for the schools, if we have 30,000 units to buy, should we buy uh, the most expensive ones or the most reasonable ones uh, for that? So then that comes to the next question, which, which uh, I think we, we constantly ask government is, why is the local product more expensive than the one from China or India and so on? That's a question we want to answer because we want to make our product um, competitive. So if we take examples, and it's again, it's this coherence, and we're saying we look at it systematically. Um, the pharmaceutical sector, we've been talking about VAT uh, for a long time, and what we've we've been zero rated. It's been a zero rated um, regime, and now it's going back to exempt. It's you know Hadija can give you the technicalities of it, but it is always for manufacturing exempt VAT always puts you at a disadvantage because you cannot. Uh, claim back your VAT. And the challenge is that it then means whoever imports product, um, and in their countries, most countries of the world, there's, uh, you know, uh, there's no VAT on exports and so on, they are getting refunds, they're getting no VAT on whatever they are putting in. So you're making the local manufacturer um, have a disadvantage against global markets. So definitely we want people to, uh, you know, buy Kenya and build Kenya, but it's because the Kenyan product is also competitive and we want to remove tax structures, tax complications that are making it difficult for Kenyan manufacturers to, to be able to compete. And then secondly, just to say that uh, buy Kenya, build Kenya is the beginning. And it's true, you, you, you know, charity begins at home, so you must start um, that way. But eventually, if we're going to uh, industrialize, and as other world countries in the world have industrialized, it's got to be about export markets. Yeah. It's not just about what chairs the government buys, because the government buys how many chairs? Even the 30,000 schools, once we've equipped them, what do we do next? So we must think global markets. We need to find niches where we are making things that the whole world wants, 
and we are the only ones or we are the best at making them at the best price yeah and mr region that's where the conversation really goes how competitive are we even for the international markets and are we really leveraging on the advantages that are unique to kenya but how then do you make sure that the cost of production leaves the manufacturers at a point where they have an advantage that they can produce in mass and export and even fulfill the local market as well i think it it, it goes back to many of the comments that my colleagues were saying like uh, Kwame, i liked when he mentioned that um interconnectivity is very important because again uh, another one has also said that um this is short term build kenya buy kenya is going to buy kenya build kenya is going to be a short term intervention because very soon all governments will be, all government entities will be equipped so then what next then we'll go to the local you know the local person the question is are they enabled do they have the disposable income to buy these goods then after looking at the local then we look at the export market talking to export market again the the issue of competitiveness comes in are we able to compete to compete on the on the on the international scene or even just within the region and that's where I, earlier i was saying that let's move away from tax because tax is a balancing act and as an accountant i will say where there is a credit there is a debit so if they give you tomorrow today you smile and then you expect for a takeaway the following day now government has to think of another way to to, to really support and uh, enable businesses to be more competitive and that's why i was saying um, areas around subsidies areas around tax holidays because the, the the nature of tax holidays and exemptions we give they are more geared towards fdi foreign direct investment you will not find many local companies getting those holidays but if you give that that local company a holiday as opposed to deterring imports coming in because i'll tell you I, i'm here jen is here if a local product a cosmetic for my face is not good however much you you you, you impose import duties on it i'll still buy it i can afford it and many other people can afford it but it's not like i really want that product i want to hear that there is a consistent company that has been will produce this nice good standard and competitive product for me to be able to use yeah. and also i will not buy it today and in two months it's not there so sustainability of businesses and competitiveness is very very important but it takes not only the manufacturers but also government to deliberately target it not from a fiscal perspective because that's where we've been really playing a lot and we've been throwing uh, stones at glass houses there's <laughs> been retaliation from the countries we are supposed to we are trying to deter yeah. it's it's more around the standards the competitiveness and how that is going to be achieved could i just add yeah, yeah. to that i think the, the other thing to note from that on the global competitiveness one thing covid has done is that it's made people think about diversifying their source of um, products yeah. um, and i think it's not necessarily going to be that they are going to have production in every single country they operate in but they just want different points because we, people have realized there was over reliance on say china and india uh, especially and people are starting to think about that now that is a huge huge opportunity for kenya and africa because the, as companies start looking for where they can go for diversification we need to be aware of them and even within our budget and our structures whatever we are doing how are we going to attract those people how are we going to get some of those uh, investments in here because they will help grow the entire economy as well all right we have about 20 minutes left to end this conversation but we also welcome your views on social media on twitter youtube facebook let's keep them coming use come live as the hashtag and miss ndungo there's a question here from kusoko is uh, joining us on social media he says is buy kenya build kenya only meant for the large businesses my question would be is just assembling vehicles enough we have so many smes producing great products that's from kusoko there i think the question itself is already an answer because there are very many other uh producers who are making excellent products for this market it's only that the the budget or the statement zero in on motor vehicles but i must say it's just a beginning 
who knows next year's budget will will include a few more uh, products should it then have been a fund where people SMEs can join and find out if you have a product that is selling then you get some level of cash and also a way of paying it back rather than zeroing it in on uh, vehicle manufacturers I think the funds are there because when you look there is the youth fund there is the women fund there is the Uwezo fund there is also the new credit guarantee scheme so the funds are there it's accessing um for me i felt if i was government i would put all these things under one fund because sometimes you wake up you wonder do i go to the women fund do i go to weso fund do i go to the youth fund i think it would be uh, important for government to consolidate all these funds where we know every sme who has something to do can go there and get the money so the funds are there yes all right then uh, yeah go ahead go ahead yes so while i'm still on the on the issue of production and uh, just joining in on what my colleagues have said i would think this is also the opportune time for us to really strengthen our our value chains because we have the african continental free trade area coming how are we going to be major players in those supply chains so as we are addressing uh import substitution are we also strengthening ourselves to the level whereby when we start operating under the bigger uh, trading block, we can access those markets by virtue of the quality of our products, by virtue of the competitiveness of our products. And lastly, I would like to, to just mention that we have seen um, a tendency also of the government to handle the state-owned enterprises with sort of kid gloves. Because we see now there's a, a technical team that is going to be tasked with looking at the state-owned enterprises to see what is ailing them and to make recommendation. While for, for me, from where I stand, I see this is information that is out there. Everybody would be able to name to name at least five state-owned uh, enterprises that are non-performing. So why handle them with kiddie gloves, give them a period to have a report, yet there is a, a, a lot of a push for the private sector to perform and pay revenues. So that's what I wanted to add. Interesting perspective. There's a question here for Mushai. And of course, I'd like to also, Mr. Adija, to weigh into this because you're the one who spoke about FDI. Ondiro Oganga says, Mushai, for investors to invest in the country, there must be a sustainable business environment. How can the government ensure they woo investors into the country? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. And I think all countries in the world kind of ask this question. Um, but I, I also, we like to distinguish when we are, uh, as Kenya Association of Manufacturers, that it's not just bringing in foreign direct investment, they are also local investors. How do we woo, and I think there was a report the other day about how much money goes, leaves this country after it has been made, but it's largely because people are not seeing the investment uh, opportunity or it's not as, as rich. So it's, when you think about attracting investors, you want to make it, a good investment space for whoever is investing, not just necessarily somebody who is coming from an um, international place. But it's the things we talked about. One is just that consistency in policy. People need to know what is going to be the case. Um, and what tends to happen is when we don't have uh, more stable consistency in um, the, our tax policy, our even regulatory environment, you get shorter term investments because they, that's how people are managing the risk. They don't know what is going to happen five years from now, 10 years from now. So what we do is we say, I'm going to invest in something that can give me money in two years or one year and so on. And so you find them maybe in things like uh, real estate or, you know, they, they'll buy shares on the stock exchange because they can they can quickly get in and get out. But if you're going to build a manufacturing plant, which the process, and especially large manufacturing plants, the whole process of even building it, say from design, concept, inception to uh, operating, could take you three years. Now, if you don't know what the tax regime is going to be, uh, forget about 10 years, even at the end of those three years, it's very difficult to plan. And then you're also trying to look at where are the markets around us, who am I going to be serving out of that? So consistency is one of the, the areas we need to look at. 
The one big C we haven't talked about, and I'm glad though it was a very good positive thing in the budget, uh, that we are getting more money for anti-corruption. Because corruption is one of the bigger issues. People want some level of certainty in what is going on, and corruption is one of the biggest distorters of what uh, might be going on. So those are the things I think most people are looking for. And then, of course, again, the, 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 the idea of where is the market going to be? Is it going to be for export or just for local um, consumption. local consumption? And there is, uh, of course, there are the other regular things about rule of law and uh, that kind of thing. Um, we are talking also about one of the things we, we realize and we hope will not be the case is also the, the just we talk about political certainty or political uh, stability because that, that actually helps when we have um, some level, there's always political contestation, but it's whether it's within a stable environment, right. yeah. Mr. Dija, what's your answer to Ondiro Ganga here, who's wondering how can the government ensure they woo more investors into the country? Keeping in mind what Mishai has just said, that we do have local investors, but we know they're owed more than 100 billion in pending bills right now. And then there's the time value of money. By the time you're paying the local investor who's always been owed for four years, he cannot invest, he's sunk in so much into debt that the money doesn't even help. I think uh, I want to start with uh, stating that um, EY undertakes an Africa attractiveness survey to show which countries in Africa are more attractive and what do investors want and hope to get in some of these countries. And surprisingly, all the years we've done this, tax hasn't come anywhere near the top five. Investors want things like uh, lower power tariffs, power. I know power is there, but the question is, are the tariffs low or high? Investors want infrastructure. Investors want uh, availability of inputs. Investors want uh, what Mushai has talked about, uh, predictable, consistent, and stable tax policies. So if these are in place in a very strategic and uh, deliberate manner, then uh, government can move in investors. But I also wanted to say that uh, Government also needs to do more in ensuring that some of these come in through public-private partnerships. Come of, some of these come through venture capitalists, people who are coming to buy other or to absorb other smaller entities. Then yeah. the local entities will not be swallowed out. So if government deliberately looks at these and uh, streamlines and organizes them, I think we could, uh, we, we could really, really uh, get FDI. But in addition to that, I wanted to also touch the issue of trade blocks. Because I, I, I've heard with uh, Kenya is part of ESC, Kenya is part of COMESA, and now we are having the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. Many entities, when you're advising and they want to venture into any area in Africa, they ask about the trade blocks. And when you tell them about the ESC and where we are, it's uh, ideally a common market which is not implemented. Customs union we are supposed to have achieved before. It's also not fully that operational. There are a lot of non-tariff barriers. These are things that really investors look at and they're like, are we really going to benefit? We need things like mutual cooperation. We need uh, you know, the non-tariff barriers out and they're still there. So if government also works on making sure that the trade blocks are implemented to the letter, then that can win FDI. Okay. And Kwame, there's also another question here for you. Kusoko again says, a question to Kwame. The manufacturing sector each year says the budget has been made in their favor. I'm not sure how true that is. But all along, the issue of predictability in policy is a problem. How can this be sustainable? That's the question he's asking. Um, okay. Well, uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, because from what we've had, uh, it's a mixed picture. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a give on one side, and yes, and that obviously is not a predictability. Yeah. And, 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 and as uh, Khadija just said, look, Business people, even if you decide to, 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 to levy some tax, uh, if business people can calculate and they know it's a stable amount, they'll decide whether the investment is worth making or not because provided there's stability. So tax is not necessarily the things that necessarily worries all businesses the most. I think what worries them is just basically what are the other underlying things. So for instance, when you're making an investment uh, as a manufacturer, you're not thinking that for four years I'll not be able to get back my input tax, which was uh, the, the VAT that was, was held. Th that, that doesn't come because the assumption is government has a level of competence that this is something that I can assume within a month or the most, a couple of weeks, I'll get it. And if I can't, 
Other people do it by I net it off something else because the records are available and they are they can be audited if that becomes a necessity. So th there are all those things that government does. Um, and I think one of the things we need to actually just tell the people who manage the Kenya Revenue Authority to just relax and take a, fre a, a, a breath of fresh air because most people who actually invest do not intend to run uh, tomorrow. So even if you have a dispute with them, um, it'll have to be solved because these people, anybody who invests in manufacturing actually uses it for their living and that's what they do full time. So this idea that uh, there's always cheating and everything else and all that, I mean, if everybody cheated, it would be, things would break down too, too quickly because even their own business partners would not trust them and stuff like that. So I think uh, that's it. But my view about this is, if there's an intention to give a tax incentive, I think it's also important to communicate how long so that government also binds itself because you don't bind people to make a, say, two million, I mean, X number of million shillings of investment but they don't know what you'll change next week that actually just makes a mess of the whole investment. So that kind of stability is important. And it's not just tax. So that's one. Two, if government is going to provide incentives and use money, my view is that government should actually provide, or rather when you're responding to an emergency or responding to an uh, economic stimulus, use the money that government spends in a way that builds markets. Uh, as opposed to just saying that we've splashed this amount of money here and there. So, as I said, if our problem right now is that we cannot get enough test kits, right? Provide an opportunity for, for private sector people to say, if you guys can get us 10,000, here is money for you to claim. They'll fix it. <laughs> I'm sure they will. <laughs> They'll fix it. And the third, and the, and, 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 and the, and the third point is, um, I think if you have a, if you have a, as, as Hadija said, let's not load the budget with things that can be settled administratively. Very few countries actually, to be honest, plan for the refunds because they know the refund is a net effect <laughs> that is, a, is, is managed administratively. So let's, let's take off these things off the budget so that you don't give the impression that we're actually giving a gift to people when they've lent you money at no cost for, for two years. So uh, part of it is just for us to be honest with ourselves by saying, look, this is the situation. This is money we actually owe and we need a solution for it. If, if it's been outstanding for too long because government has tight finances, then provide a solution for it so that people can plan around it as well. But if you owe 130 and you're giving 10 billion for a year, I mean, it's going to take you. <laughs> <laughs> you're saying I'll never refund you, these guys. Yeah. Uh, live with it. Yeah, right. so, yeah. And we still have Ondiro Ganga here who says, price wise, we are not able to compete because of cost of production. The whole chain of production is expensive. Kenyan goods cannot compete price wise and still make a profit. Walter Kamau says Kenya should think of other incentives apart from tax incentives. Kenyans asked for an extension on agreement on subsidies in WTO Doha in 2001 to subsidize export promotion programs. And then we have a final one here. This goes to Mushai. How has the this is from Sam Kumu. He says how has the budget made allocations for small scale manufacturers like someone who manufactures tissue paper in their compound and is looking to scale up or someone else making chevda in their house and supplying their local shops and supermarkets looking to scale up as well i hope you know what chevda is <laughs> <laughs> i used to enjoy eating chevda yes <laughs> it's, uh, it's tasty i think this is um you know when when we are doing national budgets especially and i think the the, the different measures that we are taking and so on and we, are, we were talking earlier about the complexity we put into the the systems i think jane also talked about uh whether smes are able to uh, participate in government tenders and so on and part of the thing is the complexity of these things so we talk about w if you want to be helped and you're that size of fund are you going to go to where's are you going to go to women's what are you going to be required to do and I think some of these things is, uh, was mentioned earlier is how can we simplify the incentives that we do give and the way to do it is to broaden them. So for instance, uh, a good one was like the, um, the reduction in the income tax at the lower level. And at that SME level, because most of the employees I presume would be within that framework, that is helping the SME as well by, by you know incentivizing the employees etc so that they are able to work so it's difficult to start getting um, measures that help those those people uh, directly but we know also what their challenges are we have an SME hub here and uh, we are trying to grow that so that we have more engaging more with SMEs to see what their issues are a lot of the times the issues are around finance 
and how they can access finance. And then we and we've talked about how if the government keeps borrowing uh, money, that makes it harder, uh, even harder for an SME because the risk uh, compared with government or even now a larger manufacturer is huge. So. If, if there was more money in the banking sector just available to them, it is easier for them to, to get. Um, and I think, you know, generally what you'd look at is that for the economy to grow is not about specific incentives that the government gives directly. And I think we, we have that problem sometimes also in private sector because we joke about, uh, you know, Sirikali's idea. Yes. And sometimes corporate... Uh, what is it called? It's called corporate largesse or corporate charity. We tend to be the, the bigger beggars of those things. So we need systems or how we structure the economy so that it is not necessarily that you get a check from the government that helps you, but the government has created an environment and that there are other people, there are other players that you're able to connect with and who can help you. A second one, just a, a in a final one to raise, especially for SMEs, which we are really trying to push, is about this liquidity thing and payment. Because how do we get a culture of paying people? And I, I know for a lot of small SMEs, one of their biggest issues when we talk about capital is because they've made chevdas, they've taken them to a shop, and they haven't been paid. And they have to come back again day after day, and like, when am I going to be paid? And this kind of thing. So we need to have... Uh, Better practice, maybe uh, it is already legal to hold people's money. So it's a, how do we strengthen just the practice and the legal enforcement so that people can be paid when they are, you know, when they produce something, how are they paid? So that uh, that grows the environment. And then thirdly, what we're trying to do in our um, SME hub is also education. Because starting a business and running a business is not an easy task. It's quite systemic. It's a... It's, uh, broad-based things, you need a lot of skills, whether it's in finance, in leadership, in technical parts about is your chevda tasting good, does it go bad in two days, um, all those kind of things. So what kind of training can we give to um, especially SMEs? And I think earlier on uh, it was mentioned, we need to check through our education system, are we giving people the skills that are actually required to make a good chevda? Right. Thanks. I want to thank you all for having this very robust conversation and most of you for tuning in online as well and asking all the questions that you've asked. We are running out of time here, but I wouldn't do justice if I don't call on Dr. Simon Gidhuku, to he's the fiscal policy manager at Kenya Association of Manufacturers, just to make his closing remarks. Asante sana. Thank you, Trevor. And thank you all for participating uh, physically and virtually in this talk on the hits and misses for the manufacturing sector in Kenya. Uh, as we close, I'll just make uh, four key remarks. The first one is, uh, I think from the conversation that we have had, there is a feeling that uh, it was business and usual, as usual in terms of budget in unusual times, and the budget should have been more ambitious. The second uh, issue is that um, for manufacturers, the key challenge at the moment, both including for the SMEs, is liquidity constraints. And that raises a question, how do you do that? How does the government provide additional support to the economy and businesses in a fiscally constrained environment? So we have had the Treasury, the CS, uh, indicating that they have uh, sought moratorium. I think uh, there is still room if we push, even as an Afri uh, under the EU uh, framework, including the IMF and the World Bank, to seek an additional moratorium for debt repayment until 2021. And I think even that issue of uh, including bringing in uh, private creditors on board I know that issue of uh, the issue of uh, being considered to have defaulted will arise, but I think it is a solution that can be found. A solution can be found. The second thing is that, as has been mentioned in this conversation, there could have been a standstill on some capital expenditure. I'm aware that the Public Financial Management Act of 2012 requires that uh, 30 percent of expenditure be 
on cap be capital expenditure. I believe this in a, in such an issue or situations uh, that could have been um, something could have been done to reallocate money to combat to flatten the curve for COVID and support businesses because the priority for businesses manufacturers is to survive during this crisis period. The third comment is that we have had uh, manufacturers and also experts who are joined this uh, panel about policy coherence and stability. That is a big, big challenge because manufacturers, when they are planning, they make long-term plans. I remember um, a manufacturer calling me and telling me that uh, uh, what do they do? They have just imported a machine and uh, a v uh, 14 percent per, uh, VAT has been imposed. And that the implication was that they required 40 million to pay to KRI and they did not have that money. So that hits them directly. Uh, hits their cash flow directly and they had not budgeted for that. The final issue is that uh, we have seen manufacturers are ready to uh, survive and are willing, are determined to survive. The K CAM KPMG study that uh, was launched last month, May 2020, 80, over 80% of manufacturers are hopeful they will survive and they have started adapting their businesses. We saw them responding very quickly to produce BPEs, <coughs> ventilators. We urge the regulatory bodies to be agile. For example, standards. How do we go about coming up with the standards quickly so that the manufacturers can take advantage in the domestic and regional market as uh, they struggle with the uh, subdued demand. Having said that, I wish to thank uh, uh, the, our CAM CEO, Fides, for opening, uh, making the opening remarks. Rachel from EY making the highlights for especially tax measures and their implication on the manufacturing sector. Our distinguished panelists, uh, Musa, Mushai Konyiha, uh, CAM Vice Chair, Jane from Safar Group, Kwame Owino from uh, uh, Institute of Economic Affairs, Adija from uh, EY, and our moderator, Trevor. And uh, there are also part virtual participation from uh, KRA team, Treasury, and uh, Ministry of Industrialization. We are really grateful to all our members who participated virtually. Asante Sana, and also the media, and all the technical teams involved. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day, and a nice week ahead. All right. Back to you, Trevor. Thank you so much for that, Dr. And Thank you all for tuning in online on Facebook, on YouTube, and every engagement that we had. We do not take it for granted. Keep the conversation going on hashtag come live. The questions you may have will still be answered. This is the, the conversation on EUI Live stops now but it continues online. I want to thank you all for making time. And remember, every voice counts, no matter how little. It is important that we have these conversations because you know what they said. At the end of the day, we will not remember the persecution of our enemies, but the silence of our what? Our friends. My name is Trevor Mbijo. It was a pleasure having you with us. Bye for now.